Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Do you understand the faithfulness of God? Now, many people who are believers, they know God is faithful. But if you were to pose that question to them, asking for an explanation, they might struggle to respond about God's faithfulness. Where would you learn about God's faithfulness? And the answer is in his covenantal promises. When we look at the scripture, we see that God has made numerous covenants with individuals and with people. And what's important about that is God in these covenants are always, always faithful. Even when there's prophecy concerning the disobedience and the rebellion of the children of Israel or that southern kingdom, Judah, and God says, I'm going to cast you aside. I will divorce the people of my covenant. But no sooner after these proclamations of judgment and divorce, what do we see? God calling his people to repent and God reaffirming his covenantal promises and prophecies about them being secure in him through his faithfulness. And also what is seen is God's grace. So God's grace, he provides what we don't deserve, but what we desperately need in order that his faithfulness can be received by his people and thereby his people can behave faithfully. Well, as you know, we are studying the prophecy of Isaiah and we come to a great chapter, chapter 11. So take out your Bibles and look there with me to the book of Isaiah and chapter 11. In this session, we're going to look at the first 10 verses. And when I look at it, in my Bible, there is a sentence over this chapter to help us understand what it is about. And it says, Shaton Hasidic Shoha Choter Mi Geza Yishai, which means the righteous ring of the shoot or twig from the stump of Yishai or Jesse. And it all speaks about God's covenantal promise to King David that from him would come the Messiah. And again, once God makes a covenant, God may distance himself momentarily from that covenant because of someone else's disobedience, their rebelliousness. But in that same generation or another generation or down the road, you will see God always, always affirming, restoring, and fulfilling his covenantal promise. David was not a perfect man. David sinned, and his children sinned. But nevertheless, God did in fact raise up from David an offspring that would indeed be Messiah. And of course, we're speaking about Yeshua. And this prophecy from Isaiah chapter 11 goes a great deal in helping us understand God's faithfulness and also perceiving properly not only the identity of the Messiah, but the work of Messiah. And what this alludes to is a basic theological phrase, and that is the person and the work of Messiah. 
It is vital that we understand who is Messiah, the person of Messiah, his character, and also his attributes. And then secondly, what he is going to do. Primarily, this prophecy deals more with his second coming. His first coming, he did what was necessary in shedding his blood, that blood that would bring about eternal redemption, that justification that would enable sinful people through the God's grace to be called saints, his holy ones. But also, when he returns, he's going to establish that kingdom of justice and righteousness. And this, for the most part, is what we're going to learn in this 11th chapter. Now, be assured, I went diligently through the vocabulary, the grammar here, so that we can have the accurate, simple meaning of the text. And you may find that some words don't agree with your translation. And even when you go further into looking at these words through, for example, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, oftentimes they give an explanation based upon how words are translated rather than the origin of that word. So look with me to verse 1, Isaiah 11 and verse 1. And there shall go forth, and this word choter is a, a twig or a shoot that, that comes forth. But one of the things I would point out is this, that very first word in the Hebrew text, going forth, is a word that oftentimes relates to redemption. It is the verb that the noun, the exodus, comes from. And the exodus from Egypt for the children of Israel always has a redemptive implication. So when we look at this word, according to the sages who have studied it throughout Scripture and seen the context more often than not, when this word, let's set, appears in the Scripture, we see that it has to do with redemption. And here he's speaking of bringing the outcome of that first word of redemption, padut, the payment, what he did in his first coming. Now we're seeing the outcome of that payment, the giulah, the redemption, that is the results of his first work. So look again, verse 1. And a shoot or a twig shall go forth from Geza. Geza is a, a stump. So it's as though, and this is the important thing that, that replacement the theologians don't understand. They want to announce over and over those scripture when God says, I'm going to judge Israel. I'm going to cast them away. I'm going to remove them. But they never deal with other prophetic passages that says that God's going to renew his relationship because of who he is, because of his namesake. Not because Israel deserves it, merits it, has earned it, or has repented. God's going to do his work of faithfulness because of who he is. And as a response to that, a remnant from the house, the literal house of Jacob, physically, will respond spiritually. So do not be those who are false teachers who want to interpret God's faithfulness to the Jewish people in the last days to say, well, this symbolically refers to the Gentiles. It does not. Now, does that mean that there won't be multiple Gentiles, multiple nations, people from every tribe, nation, and people being saved? Of course. God created Israel to be a blessing to the nations, but there will be a remnant of the literal, physical descendants of Jacob. And in the last days, it's going to be the vast majority. This is an important truth that cannot be denied in the Scripture. So we read here, and shall go forth a twig from the stump 
of Jesse. Stump as though that covenant promise to David was cut down. And it was dead, a stump. But at the right time, because of who God is, because of his covenantal promises, a twig, a shoot went forward. And then we have another help to understand, help us understand that it's speaking about Messiah. We have Jesse, the father of David. So it's the messianic covenant that God made with David in 2 Samuel 7. And then we have a Netzer. Netzer comes from the same word as Nazarite or Nazareth. Now this has nothing to do with the Nazarite vow we see in the book of Numbers in chapter, chapter 6. But rather it has to do with a different word, Nun Sade Rush, not Nun Zain Rush, sounds similar. But this word, Nazareth, or Nazareth, it has to do with that city. And when we look at that word, as I've shared before, it has to do with keeping, guarding. It has to do with denying oneself for obedience to God. So this tells us that this one who's going to come forth, this twig from the stump of Yeshai, Jesse, is going to be one that denies himself in order to keep the word of God. So a, a twig, it's a synonym. synonym. We have Choter in the first half and Netzer in the second. They simply are synonyms that speak about a, a small branch beginning, a twig shooting forth from his roots. From whose roots? The roots of Jesse, Yeshai. And it says that this twig is going to flourish. It's word for blossoming. So it is going to be fruitful is another way that we can say of it. He's going to be successful. He's going to produce the fruit of, of God. Look now to verse 2. And upon him shall rest, shall be place the spirit of the Lord. That term Lord, yud Vavhe. vav he. So it's the spirit of the Lord. Now, usually in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, we see the phrase as in Genesis 1, Ruach Elohim, meaning the spirit of God. But here we have the spirit of the Lord. And most of the rabbinical scholars, they see the Lord, this yud heh vav -Heh, being used here to speak about God who was and is and will be. Speaking about his faithfulness, speaking about that for God, time, time is, is not a limitation. He transcends it. So he's remembering past promises. He is going to work in the present and they're going to have future implications. And the spirit always has the, the concept. It gives the context of the passage one that says that God's going to bring order, his order, his will into the circumstances. So the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge, knowing all things, and the fear, Yerat Hashem, the fear of of the Lord. So we have a very complete definition of, of the character of the Spirit of God and the benefits of the Spirit of God. And when we look at these words, we find that, that we are given by means of the Spirit. We're given wisdom and understanding. That wisdom and understanding talks about how to utilize the knowledge of God how to share that knowledge with other, with counsel. And when it's done properly, we become a recipient of power that might. And it all demonstrates God's priority, the fear of the Lord, His priority. Look at verse 3. Now, the vast majority of English translations, in fact, I would just encourage you, 
go to Bible Hub and just put in Isaiah 11, 3. And you're going to find that there's going to appear around 26, 27 different translations for this verse. You'll have the New American Standard, the King James, the New International Version, and all types of ones. Some which are frequently uh, used, others which are not so well known. And, and virtually none of them get it right. And it's not a hard word. Now, the word for spirit is ruach. It comes from the, the verb lariach, which is to smell. So when there's a, a spirit or a wind or a fragrance or a scent, all of this is tied to this word ruach. You have the word ruach for spirit or wind, and you have the word reach for a smell, a fragrance. But, but it comes from the same root. And that root in the verbal is a word for smell. Now, check how many of these have. It's a simple word. No one who speaks Hebrew would, would not put this as the first and the most likely translation or definition of this word. But, but the English translations don't. Strong's do not get it right. We find over and over, they tend to go with the popular translations rather than the real meaning of the word. Now, most of the time, that's not a problem, but there are times more, more frequent than you might think when it does. Look at verse 3. Vaharicho beyerat Hashem, which means, and he will smell it. It speaks about being able to discern through a scent. What? Being able to discern through a scent, an odor, the fear of the Lord. His priority, whether someone is behaving in this way or not. Let me give you an example. When a person lies, lie brings stress to us. Do you realize that? When a person is, is being asked to tell the truth and he lies, oftentimes he begins to sweat or perspire. And even if you don't see, see that sweat, the body goes through a physical change when you lie. And when you go through that physical change, your body will, will produce different scents, different odors. And so what it says here, and by the way, a, a psychiatrist will tell you that sometimes a smell can bring about great memory. You smell something, it's like you're taken back to that situation. There's an account where someone Witness a, a terrible thing. They were in the, the ocean, and the ocean has a smell, and the boat that they were in capsized, and many of the beloved family members of this individual died. It was a, a, a tragic time. And this person had, a when he was rescued, a, a blanket put around him, and that blanket was wet, and it just reflected the scent of the ocean. And this person says every time that he smells that same fragrance, it causes him, it just takes him back to that situation. So a smell can be a very strong, strong indicator. And what we find here is this twig, this this shoot from Jesse the Messiah, who the Spirit of God, the Spirit of wisdom and knowledge and understanding and, and all is going to rest upon him, he will smell it, meaning through smelling, he will be able to discern the fear of the Lord. And it says, and not with the appearance of eyes, his eyes. He's not going to have to see it in order to know the reality of situation. He's not going to have the appearance of his eyes when he will judge and not the hearing of his ears when he reproves. 
So it's saying here that Messiah, he is going to be able to render judgment perfectly because of what he smells. Now, so many times English Bibles translate this differently, but it's not difficult to understand it. Verse 4, all of this has to do with Messiah's judgment. His ability to judge and the outcome of his judgment is going to be righteousness. Look at verse, verse 4. And he will judge with righteousness the dalim. Dalim is the word for meager ones, meaning those who are stricken seriously with poverty. They have so little. So he is going to judge with righteousness those who are, are, are poor, those who have meager means. And he will, vehokiach, means to reprove with equity. Now, this is the word mishor. Mishor can, if we talk about it from a, a ge geographical standpoint, it speaks of the word plain. So a plain is not a, a mountain that, that goes up with a peak, but it's flat. And, and this word for plain can mean when we put it as an adjective for describing righteousness or justice, it has to do with the phrase, probably best would be equity. He is going to give that which is equitable, that which is upright. He is going to judge honestly. So look at verse, verse 4. And he will reprove with equity the humble of the earth. I think most of the English will say the meek of the earth, but it has to do with those who are humble. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. Meaning, in the same way that he can judge uniquely, he will also be able to simply speak and the punishment will come forth. So notice how these same terminology and symbols and such are also seen in the book of Revelation with the second coming of Messiah. Once more, verse, verse 4, he will judge with righteousness the meager. He will reprove with equity for the meek or the humble of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. He'll just speak judgment in being and with the spirit of his lips. This can also be with the breath of his lips. He will slay, yamit, he will kill the wicked. So Messiah is coming to judge when he comes the second time. Verse 5. And it will be righteousness that he will gird his waist. And with faith, the faithfulness, he will gird his loins. So that and these terms for girding has to do with a servant. He is going to bring about the will of God. He is going to serve his heavenly father purpose, this eternal son of God. He always does his father's will. And he's going to do that with righteousness and by faith. This is the important thing we see here. And with righteousness, he will gird his waist. And the faithfulness, he is going to gird his loins. Verse 6. Because of this, notice there's going to be a change in nature. Why? Because this creation is going to go through a change. What is natural now because this world is stained and corrupted with sin, it is going to go through a change. Now, let me point out something to you. Rambam, who is seen as the greatest interpreter within Judaism, he says Messiah will do no miracles, and in Yomot HaMashiach, the days of Messiah, and he's speaking about the kingdom, there will be no change to nature. He interprets this incorrectly, very spiritually, very symbolically. He spiritualized the text and says, oh, well, this, and look at what it says, verse, verse 6, where it says, 
and the wolf will dwell with the, the sheep. He says the sheep is the Jewish people. The wolf are the Gentiles. So he symbolically and spiritualizes this. I think this is a terrible error. We ought not. Literally, what's going to happen in the millennial kingdom, there's going to be a change. It is going to return to what was experienced in the Garden of Eden. Originally, in the Garden of God, where all animals ate simply, simply, Vegetation. Animals did not shed blood or eat meat with blood. So we read the wolf will dwell with the lamb or the sheep. And the namer, namer is like a tiger or leopard with the kid, meaning a kid goat or young, young lamb. Will he will lie down. And the calf and the young lion, and the fatling together. So there's going to be peace between these species that now they would eat one another. They would kill one another. But at this time, none of that is going to happen. There is going to be tranquility, peace. There's not going to be war between the animal species, but peace is going to be established for all. And then look at the end of verse 6. Ve na'ar katon noheg bam. And a little child is leading them. Now, if your Bible puts it into the future, it is wrong. It is in the present. Some would say it's a participle, which is fine. A participle is that which is used to describe. So this little child, he is leading. It wants to describe this one as leading, leading them. So they're going to be in submissiveness, subjection to a small child. Verse 7. And the, the cow and the bear will graze together, and their offspring will lay down together. A lion as cattle, he will eat hay or straw. Now, this talks about a change, and that is that animals are not going to eat meat. They're not going to harm one another, but they're going to eat just like cattle eats uh, uh, vegetation so too will a line at this time. There's going to be peace. Once more, verse 8, Yonek, Yonek is a child that is nursing. So one that's very young, less than, than three, probably around two. He will play above the, the hole of a python. Now, we have two, and the second will have the second, two types of, of snakes. This first one, if you look at the Hebrew, it's the word pa-ten. Some pronounce the tav as a th, so it's python or python. And over the den of, and this is like a, a cobra, it's a different type of, of snake, a child that is weaned. So this is going to be one who is three, four, five, or six. He will stretch forth his hand. So in a seemingly very dangerous place in our age, it will have no problem. Notice what it says in verse 9. Lo yireu, which means there will not be any evil. Some will say, no harm, that's fine. No evil, nothing bad. No harm is going to come to them. And no destruction will be in all my holy mountain. And this is referring to Jerusalem. And here, it can be understood as in his kingdom. His kingdom is not going to produce anything. And this word, ra, although it's a verb here, it speaks about that which is in contrary to the will of God. 
Now, I was speaking, answering an email about this, this rod or staff of iron in the hand of Messiah. He's going to rule with that, which means during the millennial kingdom, Messiah will enforce one not to sin. And if they do, they're going to be punished. So it's not the same concept as we see in Psalm 2, which if that rod he's going to break into pieces when he returns in judgment. And this, this chapter has some judgment to it as well. He will destroy with the rod. We've, we've talked about that with the sword that goes forth from his mouth as well. But the rod of iron that he rules with simply is a reference that he is going to be in absolute control. So look again at verse 9. No evil, nothing outside of my will will be. No destruction in all my holy mountain. For the earth is full of the knowledge of the Lord. Now, there's great implications to this. The more you know God, the less there's going to be destruction and harm. And the more you know God, you're going to not bring about that which is destructive, but that which is a blessing. So the knowledge of the Lord is going to fill the earth as the water covers the sea. So in the same way, the water, all the sea is covered with water. All of the kingdom is going to reflect the knowledge of God. One more verse, verse 10, and we'll stop. Vehaya beyom hahu. That phrase, on that day, refers to judgment. This is a key indicator that we're speaking about the second coming. And it shall come about on that day that the root of Jesse, Shorsh Yishai, this is a reference to Messiah. It says, who is standing? Now, it's in the future. He will do this. But when these things are happening, it's telling us at that time, he's standing as a ness. A ness is a pole. It usually refers to the, the pole, which would have a banner upon it proclaiming victory the victory over the enemy. But the word nest can also be the word for banner or, or miracle. So in a miraculous way. And that's why Rambam, this is Rabbi Moses Mamadidi, gets it wrong. Messiah is going to rule through his miraculous power. Once more, verse 10. And it shall come about on that day that the root of Jesse, he is standing as a banner for the people, a miraculous victory. And unto him, nations will seek. Now, this is a reference to every tribe, every nation, every people. So there's not going to just be the Jewish people, but it's going to be the fulfillment of God's Abrahamic covenant. This kingdom is going to be full of both Jew and many, many Gentiles. So unto him the nations will seek. And the last phrase, Vehaita minuchato kavod, and his resting place, or and his rest. Either way is fine to translate it. And his rest, it's going to be, will be glorious. Meaning, and this word rest, it's related to a kingdom experience. In this age, that word is related to Shabbat, and that's why the Sabbath and the kingdom are often used symbolically for one another. So his resting place, his rest that his kingdom is going to experience and express is going to be glorious. Meaning this. It's going to be the very character of God that supports, that establishes, that, that, that really defines this kingdom experience. So Isaiah chapter 11, a great chapter. And we're going to complete the second half and this brief 12th chapter in our next installment. So I'll close with that until next week. 
May God richly bless you. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.